Hello, thank you all for joining us. My name is Shannon Cohen. I'm a product manager at Pivotal, working on the Pivotal Cloud Foundry platform. And with me today is Alan Ho, head of developer programs for Apigee. Today, Alan and I are going to share with you why APIs are so important in modern software, why Pivotal Cloud Foundry is the best place for developing, operator, and developing and operating applications that provide APIs, and how through a new service provider interface in Pivotal Cloud Foundry called Route Services, Apigee has delivered powerful API management tools to developers of applications on Cloud Foundry. Alan, do you want to take it from here? Sure, yeah, so maybe what we should first talk about is what is an API? And you know, in a very simplest terms, an API is a contract between uh, two applications. It's really about machine to machine communication. Uh, some of the technologies that are used for building APIs, uh, and specifically we're talking about web APIs, the, the, the four technologies that are commonly used is HTTP, uh, TLS, uh, which is also known as SSL uh, for security, uh, some sort of OAuth, authentication, and JSON. So these are kind of like the core API technologies. And the reason why the APIs are so appealing is because they're really simple, they're universal, and every developer knows how to talk to them. So what kind of problem are we actually trying to solve here? So, you know, you spend a lot of time building, uh, especially uh, customer uh, companies using Cloud Foundry, they're, use, they're built uh, great applications. But the problem is, how do you actually reduce the cost of onboarding new customers, managing the existing customers, and reducing your churn, right? So as a function of your, the, the influence of your software depends on how much those things cost. You want to reduce the cost of onboarding, you want to reduce the cost of management, and you want to reduce your churn. The way that you do it is via APIs. And there's a lot of capabilities within API management that makes these things much easier so that you can scale the number of custom clients uh, for your software. Uh, and uh, with that, I'd just like to uh, hand it back over to Shannon to kind of discuss uh, about a little bit more about Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So Alan highlighted how APIs enable digital collaboration. And I wanted to talk with you a bit about how those APIs are built and operated. At Pivotal, everything we do is about enabling software development teams to deliver business value faster. You'll see this as a recurring theme in the following slides. Enterprises come to Pivotal to help them transform themselves into successful software companies. And we provide training in modern development practices and a powerful technologies to support these practices. Pivotal Cloud Foundry is a modern platform for rapid development and operation of cloud native applications. What are modern platforms? Modern platforms enable modern application development practices. Cloud-native applications are designed to be repeatedly deployed to multiple environments on self-service virtualized infrastructure providers and use APIs to leverage other services. One example of these patterns are that configuration should never be checked in with source code. Configuration should be parameterized for ease of deployment to multiple environments and for security. Another example of cloud-native design is never depend on local storage for persistence as VMs are ephemeral and you should expect your app to be moved around on the infrastructure. As Pivotal Cloud Foundry is designed to run on modern cloud infrastructure services, it is optimized for these patterns. Another popular design pattern of cloud native applications is to build them as a collection of microservices that each do one thing well. This architecture allows for teams to innovate on parts of the application simultaneously with more autonomy, using versioned APIs as interfaces between them. Within a microservices architecture, services for configuration, discovery, and failure isolation are common, and Pivotal Cloud Foundry provides a suite of Netflix technologies for these functions with tight integrations for the Spring framework. With Pivotal Cloud Foundry, developers no longer need to file support tickets or wait months for environments to push new application code. They can do it themselves whenever they're ready. 
In the interest of developer velocity, self-service is fundamental to Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Pushing updates to applications with downtime is so easy that teams can receive faster feedback by deploying early and often. But even application pushes should be automated. Rather than throw a bunch of code over the wall for another team to test, modern development teams automate as much of this process as possible and monitor the results themselves. This provides the team with faster feedback on failures, leading to faster fixes while context is fresh. Through integrations with products like Concourse, Netflix, Spinnaker, Jenkins, and GitLab, each commit to source code can trigger a series of automated events that may include environment provisioning, application deployment, test runs, code promotion, and additional deployments. Automating these processes is called contiguous, a continuous integration, or CI, and automatically updating your code on your running application while, when tests pass is called continuous delivery. Pivotal Cloud Foundry enables the development team to automate the entire process from commit to deploy. Pivotal Cloud Foundry provides many more features necessary for modern application development and operation practices, so developments don't, development teams don't have to build them, these things themselves. The platform keeps your application running. We have many mechanisms to maintain high availability. For example, if an instance of your application fails, the platform recreates it in another container, possibly on another host. If a system process fails, the platform restarts it, if necessary, automate it, automatically recreating VMs, reattaching persistent, persistent, stick, persistent, di persistent disks, all without application downtime. The, app, the platform exposes metrics about your application health and request load. The platform gives you easy access to application logs to help you understand how your application is behaving. You can easily scale your app up or down to respond to demand. We're also obsessed about security and believe that this does not have to slow developers down. Applications are in an isolated containers and by default do not have access to one another. Admins can control eGuest rules for each application or groups of applications. You can redeploy the entire platform to a no good, known good state without application downtime. We have extremely fast turnaround on security patches, and these can be applied easily across every VM, every application with a few clicks of a mouse. Through contiguous in, continuous in, integration, your application runtime environment can be, can be completely rebuilt every few hours. All application instances recreated in new containers on different hosts. We call this approach, re, we call this approach repave or, and repair. And our head of security says to an attacker, it's like playing an, a nearly unsolvable video game. She needs to get to level 100, but she can't get past five because there's not enough time. Finally, Pivotal Cloud Foundry comes with an extensible operator curate, cur, curated marketplace of services that developers can leverage to reduce the list of things they have to build and operate themselves. A note about frameworks. Through use of Heroku compatible build packs, applications and their APIs can be written in any language and deployed to Cloud Foundry via the same familiar CLI tool and IDE plugin. Earlier I mentioned that Pivotal Cloud Foundry offers an extensible operator curated marketplace of services that developers can leverage. This marketplace enables developers to provision reserved resources from these services themselves, self-service, on-demand, in context. Rather than interacting with a myriad of systems or filing tickets with IT, developers are enabled to experiment with a variety of technologies through a simple, consistent workflow. The service provider interface is extremely flexible and generic, so the range of services that can be offered in this marketplace is quite broad. Of course, you have data stores for persistence, message buses, and caching, all the things that applications deployed to Pivotal Cloud Foundry would communicate with directly. Unique credentials can be provisioned for each of your applications and are delivered automatically to application, application runtime through environment variables. Developers never even need to see credentials. But the marketplace is more than that. Any tool that enables a development team to be more efficient can be offered here rather than sending them hunting for load, bound, load testing services or project management SaaS applications. These also can be made available to development teams through the marketplace. But there was a class of service that we found couldn't be offered. So 
So what are route services? Route services are a new class of service that can be offered in the Pivotal Cloud Foundry marketplace. These are services which perform some processing on application requests before they reach your application. Through a new service provider interface, we enable these services to be dynamically injected into the request path. Why are route services important? Through reuse and SASifying SAS common requirements, we minimize the things that any given development team has to build or rebuild themselves. The fewer things developers need to build and operate and maintain themselves, the faster our customers can deliver value to the market and get feedback. Common use cases for route services include performance and reliability. Rate limiting has been the most frequently requested use case. Security, authentication, and authorization is a popular use case for route services. Also, real-time analytics. As requests go through the route service on the way to applications, metrics can be captured and analyzed. I'm, every day I'm hearing about additional creative uses for this integration. In the open source community, there's a member who is developing an auto sleep service based on a route service to stop applications that aren't uh, are, that are idle, not receiving a request. I'd like to share some of the benefits of route services to the two primary personas we think about in Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Most of these apply uh, not only to route services but all to all marketplace services. For operators. We find uh, that the pain operators feel is responding to individual developer needs, uh, and that's time consuming. Responding promptly is difficult, and requests may not be aligned with policies. Pivotal Cloud Foundry provides operators with a solution they can put in place once, configured, uh, aligned with policy, and then enable developers to pick and choose in a self-service user experience. If these services are additionally packaged for distribution through Pivotal Network, these services can be deployed by an operator with a few, few mouse clicks, and applying upgrades and security hot patches is just as simple. For developers, delays caused by provisioning, filing IT tickets, uh, and not being self-service uh, causes delays for our customers and their time to market. Having to learn new systems for provisioning and configuration, each of these services further slows that velocity down. Pivotal Cloud Foundry provides developers with one-stop shopping in a single place with a consistent user experience. Here I'll provide a, a, a look into what the operator user experience actually is. There's really only two CLI commands. Uh, the first registers a service broker with Pivotal Cloud Foundry. A service broker is the component that implements the service provider interface. During this operation, the, provision, the registration operation, Cloud Foundry connects to the provider's service broker and fetches all the meta metadata about the catalog of services the broker may offer. Consider that one broker may offer half a dozen different services or just one. Each service may offer one or more plans plans being predefined configurations for the resources that a service delivers when a developer asks for it. The second command demonstrates admin control of access to services and plans. For example, an admin could enable access to the production size database cluster only for members of the production organization or workspace. There are also a number of ways Mo uh, admin operators could monitor usage of marketplace services. In addition to logs and metrics, we, are, we see here an, an API endpoint offered by the platform that shows all the events in which developers provisioned an instance of a service. Here's what the developer user experience looks like through the CLI. The first command will output all the services and plans the user has access to in their current workspace. This shows the list of market, uh, market, the, the marketplace uh, as it pertains to their currently targeted workspace. The second command shows two variations of, provisioning, of the provisioning operation. If the service they'd like to use in, is in the marketplace, they specify the service name and plan name along with a name that is meaningful to them. Alternatively, if the service they'd like to use is not in the marketplace, 
Developers may create a mock service instance. We call this a user-provided service instance, giving it a name and providing configuration data manually that a service broker would normally provide when programmatically interfacing with the platform. To leverage a compatible route service, the developer would simply provide the URL where requests should be sent for processing, and that's only necessary for creating user-provided service. That happens behind the scenes and programmatically when creating a route service through the marketplace. In the third command, the developer associates a route with the service instance by binding them. The Pivotal Cloud, Pivotal Cloud Foundry routing tier acts as a reverse proxy, matching incoming requests against a list of these routes to determine where the application, the application instances are that it should forward requests to. Routes are deter, uh, identified by a domain and host name. During the bind operation, the service broker ret may return a URL for the location of the route service programmatically. If it does, the routing tier will proxy requests that match the bound, bound route to the route service. This is the model on the left. If the route service allows the request through, it will be returned to the router, which will forward the request to the app. The app response also goes back through the route service, enabling transformation of responses or analytics on round trip metrics. The model on the left is the most dynamic of the route service integrations because only applicable requests transit the route service. It also allows an operator to easily offer an assortment of services in the marketplace. Also, as the location of the route service can be dynamically discovered, the service provider could develop their broker to provision resources on demand, spin up VMs, install software, et cetera, uh, better optimizing utilization of resources. During the bind operation, the broker does not have to return a URL to the route service. The model on the right is an example of this behavior. In this scenario, the route service is forklifted in place by IT, and all requests to the platform go through it, whether they need to or not. Through use of a service broker, the operator can still enable developers to configure the service for specific application routes using simple and familiar Cloud Foundry workflows. An example of this, as an example of this, a large operator of open source Cloud Foundry enables developers to dynamically configure their F5 load balancer as if it were a route service in the marketplace. Pivotal customers are pretty excited about the potential use cases that route services can fulfill. You may be asking yourself, where do I get them for my deployment of cloud, Pivotal Cloud Foundry? First, I should say that support for route services was recently introduced in our latest release of Pivotal Cloud Foundry version 1.7. Uh, and that was shipped just in the last couple of weeks. Pivotal doesn't offer any route services yet ourselves, so your current options are to build them yourself, which is quite simple, and we have some very good documentation on that. Or you can get them from vendors, and we're really excited that Apogee has been an early adopter of this integration and has built a route service that will be available to operators of Pivotal Cloud Foundry shortly. With that, I'd like to hand it back to Alan to tell us about API management. And power and the power of uh, Pivotal of Apogee Edge that Apogee Edge will bring to Pivotal Cloud Foundry as a route service. All right. So uh, let me first talk about what is API management. Um, API management uh, allows you to manage your APIs in ways that, let's say, a naked API cannot do. All right, so let's, let's kind of like go over some of the key capabilities. The first capability is security. Um, when you're exposing your app to the outside world, so many things can go wrong, either from hackers trying to hack into your account or developers just by accident uh, being able to, um, uh, to overflow your, your service with requests. And some of them may be malicious, some of them may be uh, not on purpose. The second capability that we have uh, that's useful for both operators and uh, product managers are uh, analytics. So we provide uh, very, we provide analytics to know how the performance of your API, uh, which gives you uh, insight into performance of your apps. 
Uh, it's broken down by the type of developer who is uh, the developer who is actually uh, calling the app. Uh, and then we also provide analytics to figure out kind of engagement of the various developers uh, with your applications. Uh, last but not least, uh, the other capability is uh, developer portals and monetization. Uh, when you're creating an app, when you're, uh, when you're creating an API, you want to try to maximize adoption but kind of reduce the amount of time it takes for a developer to onboard. So instead of having customers, you know, you know, you know, work directly with the app team to provision keys, to get access to these APIs, um, we provide uh, developer portals so that you can basically sign up uh, and start using the APIs in a self-service manner. This is very popular with platforms. Uh, it's one of the reasons why platforms such as Amazon Web Services is so popular is because they re reduced all the friction out of uh, uh, using APIs. Uh, and we have a lot of enterprises that are using uh, Apigee in order to, to gain this capability because they have some service that they would like to expose as APIs uh, to the customer. So before I get into the demo, I just want to talk a little bit about how uh, Apigee exactly integrates with the route service. So you can see here, um, you would first install the market, the Apigee tile in the marketplace. This is kind of the operator, oper uh, this is the operator um, uh, task that, um, uh, that Chen was referring to. Then you would bind the route service uh, so you would bind the Apigee route service uh, to your application. And what that means is that um, uh, when that happens, on the Apigee API management side, it automatically creates an API proxy that you can add any of the proxies to. And so when, what happens is that whenever any request gets, uh, hits the uh, uh, load balancer slash router, uh, the Go router, the API requests get forwarded on to Apigee. Uh, Apigee does, uh, applies the policies, uh, sends it back to the Go router, and then sends it to your application. And then on the way back, it goes back to, uh, on the, on the re response, it, similarly, the response goes to the router, gets forwarded to Apigee. Apigee does some processing. Apigee API Edge does processing on it, and then forwards it back to uh, the client. So I am going to do a live demo of how to actually get that to work. So Alan, while you're getting ready, um, there was a quick question, Shannon. Uh, is there, you know, is there some sort of SDK uh, or um, you know, what is the experience for? writing your own route services look like? I, you mentioned documentation earlier. Like, you know, is there a particular programming language that people have to use? Or you know, what, what is that experience like, you know, just in a few words? Sure. Uh, the integration uh, can be taken in two phases. Uh, the first phase would be an integration with the Pivotal Cloud Foundry routing tier. Uh, and that integration um, really is just the route service obeying a few uh, HTTP headers. Uh, so the route service can be written in any language as long as uh, it knows, handle, knows how to handle HTTP headers. Uh, for example, um, with the request that Cloud Foundry routing tier forwards uh, to the route service, uh, we provide a header that uh, tells the route service where to send the request once it's done processing, uh, if it does choose to forward the request to the application, uh, and also a header which enables the routing tier to um, determine that when it receives a request back from the a route service that it's already sent, uh, that that request has already been to the route service and it, instead it should go to the application. So we're not prescriptive about um, application frameworks. Uh, there is, uh, I think, very good documentation uh, there are also um, example route services in several languages, Spring uh, and Go, uh, in the documentation. There is not um, an SDK or 
um, a library yet for this integration that I'm aware of. And Thank I you so much. On and I could see oh, yeah, on Apogee's part, um, integrating with the route, building a route service was not very difficult for our engineering team at all. Uh, it just leverages APIs. Um, the route building a route service just leverages APIs. So it was a fairly trivial thing to actually create um, uh, a route service. Okay, uh, we have a few more questions uh, that are, that I will I hope. Hopefully they will be answered uh, when I give you this demo. So what I've done ahead of time is I've set up my Apigee, uh, uh, my Apigee uh, Edge organization. You can set this up too. You go to Apigee.com, just sign up. Uh, and I've also created on uh, Pivotal a service, a Hello World service. So. It's just a Hello World service. Uh, it's a naked API. There's no API management in front of it. And now I will first, the first thing I would do is I would create the Apigee route service in my environment. Okay. And then the next step is I will bind uh, my app so that all requests goes to Apigee. So if I press refresh on my other screen, you would see that this API proxy gets created um, by that bind request. So that any single, every time that a a request goes through Apigee, uh, sorry, it goes through the Cloud Foundry app, it gets forwarded into this proxy. So let's actually do some real-time tracing and monitoring of this particular API. All right. We go back here, we suddenly, we can see that the uh, we were able to uh, trace the request, and that we were we managed to get uh, information on this uh, Hello World call request. Um, other things too is that we you can actually see uh, if your proxy is created and has several extra has several policies, you can actually see the time it takes for each one of these proxies and the total elapsed time. So answering uh, the question uh, from uh, Mastercard. Uh, is the API proxy a separate process? Uh, if you mean by, is it running in a separate, uh, like on a separate, separate VM uh, or container? Yes. So th these requests are going to the router, and from the router, it's hitting uh, Apigee Edge uh, with, and is doing the proxy logic, and then it's returning the request back to the router, forwarding it back to the app, and, it's, and, the, requ and the reply route is very similar. All right, so I want to now demo kind of the capability, I want to demo the security capabilities, the analytics capabilities, as well as developer portal capabilities. So one of the most common things to ask is, if I have a, if I have a, um, if I have an API, I should probably add some, um, some rate limiting to it. So I'll add some rate limiting right now. As you can see here, there's a lot of various uh, policies that you can add here, but I'll just add the spike arrest. And I will change the rate limit to 10 requests per minute. Okay. All right. So we'll start another a new trace session, and we'll try to get and we'll try to get uh, the system to uh, to trigger the rate limiting po the spike arrest policy. Okay, so you can see here, uh, if I try to do three requests in a row in very short time, 
the spike arrest violation, it returns a 500 saying that there's a spike arrest violation in Y. And if we go back to our stray session over here, we can see um, that this policy was activated and that uh, you can see when the request was made, who was making the request, things of that sort. We go back to the develop side, you can see that you can, as, a, as an operator, you know, you have the developers creating lots of various APIs. You can dynamically add any other additional policies. Popular ones are like caching, uh, others is quota management, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we also have a lot of security APIs, uh, security policies, such as OAuth. Uh, and then we have a class that we call mediation. So this is transforming things like JSON to XML, XML to JSON. Uh, a lot of times it's also about extracting, um, it is also about extracting, uh, you know, variables or, you know, stripping out data, especially on the uh, reply path. Okay, let me, I see some questions here. Okay, how is how is the security handle between all points, route service, API, proxy, consumer, API, et cetera? Uh, I, can, I can speak to this one. So we use uh, SS, uh, TLS between the route service and the, um, the route service and the, sorry, the Cloud Foundry as well as Apogee Edge. Uh, the deployment can be, uh, Apogee Edge could be deployed in the cloud um, or it could actually be deployed within the same data center uh, or same pivotal uh, cloud foundry environment too. So there's uh, those are the kind of TLS is our major as our way that we handle security between the route service and Apogee Edge. Hey, Alan. Yep. Uh, I can answer that in the more generic case. Um, all requests from the pivotal cloud foundry routing tier to route services are over TLS. Uh, it's not possible to uh, send those requests um, unencrypted, um, but the uh, platform for development deployment, uh, development environments can be deployed so that um, self-signed certs or uh, certificates um, signed by um, um, internal authorities um, can be accepted. Also, we recommend uh, programmatically recommend to route services when we tell the route service where to send the request after processing uh, that by default um, SSL should be used, HTTPS should be used um, when forwarding the request back to the platform. Cool, thanks. Um, okay, so I'm gonna show some of the analytics capabilities. Um, so when you have lots of uh, traffic going through the platform, uh, we have these developer, we have these dashboards that are both used for operators as well as product managers. So you have a dashboard over here. It shows you the error rate as well as the, uh, the number of transactions. Uh, then we have a set of pre-canned uh, proxy, uh, sorry, pre-canned analytics. A lot of this is focused on uh, for the operators. So for example, the availability and latency of every request. Uh, we can actually dig deep into seeing where is the, um, where is the traffic coming? What is, where, where, what is, what is the, where is the time spent? So for example, you can, you can show like the average proxy time. You, you can split up the requests between time spent uh, going through Apogee Edge versus time spent hitting the actual app. Uh, you can also see which errors are coming from Apogee itself as well as the, the, the API proxies versus uh, the errors coming from the back end. We also have a lot of other capabilities. Uh, this is especially useful for uh, product managers uh, around uh, developer engagement. Uh, so, you know, when you're selling, when you're, when you're exposing your data as APIs and you're trying to get uh, people to use your API developers, you really need to treat them as if you're selling 
a SaaS product. You have to have a concept of funnel. So what happens here is that was what this funnel is showing you is that there's a total of 765 developers. Uh, of that 765, 18 of them actually created applications. Uh, and of those 18, uh, five of them are actually sending traffic. And then those, and then of those developers who are sending traffic, these are the ones that are sending lots of traffic. So this gives you the ability to figure out which developers you need to be targeting uh, for the purpose of marketing or uh, support. Uh, other other um, other use cases is you're able to use uh, geo maps, so you can figure out where your APIs are coming from, your API calls are coming from, and which countries. Uh, and then we have other uh, other uh, um, uh, reports, such as which devices are making those API calls to. So we talked quickly about analytics. The next thing I want to talk about is developer portals. So one of the one of the key capabilities of API management is to just make it very easy to create these developer portals uh, so that you can sign up developers to use your account uh, to use the services as well as you can um, you can provide documentation for them um, so this is an example of uh, we call this smart docs uh, essentially you would uh, upload a swagger document that describes your API and you can create, this is kind of like real-time interactive documentation. Taking a little while because this uh, particular API is a bit of a slow API. Okay, we got the request and we got the responses. So this is a kind of interactive documentation to make it really easy for your developers to use your APIs. Uh, we also have the ability to create accounts and create, and whenever you create a, when a developer hits the portal and creates an account, uh, the system knows that it would assign a um, developer key to those users, uh, which they would use uh, in order to, those developers would access uh, your API. We also have capabilities I'm not going to go into much more, which is around monetization. So you have all these developers. Uh, now you can create um, fairly, uh, fairly, um, you know, uh, complex uh, monetization schemes, such as um, how many, like how many people, like charge per transaction, charge per month, things of that sort, so that you can uh, bill your your users. Uh, for the usage of your API. So that gives you a quick overview. I just gave you a quick overview of some of the capabilities of Apigee. Uh, one of the takeaways that I want you to have is that it's really easy, especially if you already built an app in Cloud Foundry and you suddenly want to add these capabilities. Uh, it's just really, really easy to uh, add um, these kinds of capabilities uh, into uh, API management capabilities by leveraging the route service. So in, in, in kind of closing, um, Pivotal Cloud Foundry is a platform for building great modern software. And then Apigee's API management lets you scale out adoption of that software to lots of developers and partners. So we'll take some time to, we have about 10 minutes to take questions. Uh, I will. Yep. Uh, we got a, we got a few queued up. Um, definitely. Um, the first one, uh, I, oh, forgive me if you addressed this already, Alan, I wasn't quite sure, but um, a question from MasterCard is, uh, is an API, pro and this might be for Shannon actually, is the API proxy a separate process? It kind of depends which case we're talking about, but. Well, from Pivotal Cloud Foundry's standpoint, uh, route services are um, uh, services that run alongside or are outside of the platform. Um, much like uh, the rest of marketplace services in Cloud Foundry, 
there's no prescription for uh, how a, uh, a route service is deployed or where it runs as long as the platform can reach it uh, over HTTPS. Uh, from Apogee's perspective, I think Alan suggested that when uh, a service instance was created through the marketplace, that a, uh, a new proxy in a new container was created. Is that correct, Alan? That's correct, yeah. Excellent. So uh, okay. from a generic standpoint, route services could be uh, run as apps on Cloud Foundry or outside of Cloud Foundry. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Alan and Shannon. Um, and it's another question from the same person at MasterCard. Um, how is security handled between all points, uh, from the route service, the API proxy consumer, the API itself, et cetera, et cetera? Well, let's see. Uh, client requests to applications on the platform uh, can be made uh, encrypted or uh, unencrypted. Uh, depending on the configuration of a load balancer that sits in front of Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Uh, if you want uh, to only allow encrypted requests in, you might configure your load balancer um, not to listen on port 80, for example. Um, requests between a load balancer and the Cloud Foundry routing tier can be uh, optionally encrypted. Uh, the routing tier does support TLS termination. Uh, and uh, uh, can host a, a certificate supporting many domains. Uh, the leg between the Cloud Foundry routing tier and a route service, I think as we described, uh, is always encrypted. Uh, and uh, we recommend programmatically through the use of HTTP headers that, that the route service uh, return requests to the platform after processing um, over HTTPS also. Uh, internally, within the platform, um, requests uh, from the routing tier uh, to application containers uh, is uh, unencrypted. But we've recently uh, added support for um, optionally enabling IPsec between um, system components within the platform. Uh, so that would secure that leg. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, a question from Allstate Insurance that you answered by a chat, but I think maybe might be interesting to expand on a little bit or just um, get your take on real time. Is, uh, sure. <clears throat> from, Christine from, All from, from Allstate. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Christine from Allstate asked uh, about support for SRTP. Um, I admitted I, I'm not familiar with SRTP, but uh, while Alan was giving his presentation, I did a quick Google search and saw that it's uh, commonly associated with the voice over IP, uh, which is typically UDP, uh, and the Pivotal Cloud Foundry routing tier uh, currently only supports uh, HTTP requests. Although coming soon, uh, we have support for uh, TCP protocols. So you can, you'll be able to run uh, workloads on Cloud Foundry uh, that uh, receive um, any TCP protocol, requests over any TCP protocol. However, um, UDP uh, is on the roadmap. We're starting to think about it, um, but we have no timeline for delivery yet. Perfect. Yeah, I, just, I was, uh, yeah, exactly. I was just hoping we could make people aware that, that uh, TCP is, is coming soon and, and other protocols. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to give um, uh, some other some other folks some chance to ask some questions. We, we've had a bunch from Mastercard, so I'm going to I'll come back to you. Um, question from uh, Computer Associates, uh, CA Technologies. How does uh, Apogee Edge? How does the Apogee Edge proxy link to the Identity Store? Yeah. So uh, there's there's actually there's a lot of different ways that uh, we link to the Identity Store. And I see that there's a clarification here. If the corporate LDAP is on-premise, would Edge connect to it securely and in a performant way? So we've we've connected to various types of LDAPs, uh, including Active Directory. Uh, and the way the way that it works is that um, you know the 
the the the biggest issue the biggest issue from a um, uh, from a security standpoint is uh, making sure that the OAuth tokens are are, are created properly. Uh, and so what happens is that you know when you first do an OAuth negotiation, uh, you would contact the the LDAP system to uh, see whether or not uh, this person who's logging in is a valid person, and then at that point you would issue a OAuth token to the user. Uh, sorry, back to the application. And then the so there's actually no communication between Apogee and the LDAP system when you have live traffic going through the system. Uh, it's only that initial uh, 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 login uh, scenario. Got it. Thank you, Alan. Um, okay, a question from the Home Depot. Uh, what happens if the security protocol is upgraded or changed as we evolve over time? And uh, Shannon, looks like uh, we're looking for an example. Um, uh, Dave, if you're if you're still with us, um, which security protocol maybe are you thinking about? And, and could you provide an example um, just as a question? That would be great. Uh, in the meantime, while we're waiting for that, um, let's go back to some of the unaddressed questions from, from MasterCard. <clears throat> um, Assassin asks, uh, uh, how a security – oh, wait, excuse me. Sorry, we addressed that already. Um, he asks, apart from the TLS encryption, I'm interested in, I'm interested in understanding AIM as well. Uh, do you support FGA? I'm not sure what that is, actually. Um, I'm not familiar with FGA either. Uh, F, F is in Frank, GA. Yeah, I haven't, that's, that's a new one. Um, I'm just doing a quick Google search here. Hmm. Fine green auditing. Maybe if Sasan is still uh, uh, with us, uh, Sasan, maybe you could clarify um, uh, how you imagine uh, AIM um, and are you thinking uh, about AWS in particular, how AIM applies to uh, what we've been speaking about? Are you thinking about securing requests to route services or some other mechanism? Um, he replied and said something about fine-grained access. Um, is not what I found on Google, so that's good. <laughs> um, while we wait for some, some clarity to come in there, um, okay, this looks like a comment back from, from uh, oh, okay, hold on, coming in real time. This just in. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, Home Depot, Dave from Home Depot is asking, uh, generally speaking, if we move from TLS to, say, core security, uh, you know, some other, security protocol, right, that he just made up uh, in the next two to three years. You know, if we move off TLS to something else, you know, what, what kind of impact sure. does that have? Sure. So um, um, Pivotal is, uh, I'd like to say, a, um, uh, an agile company. Our, um, our software is uh, continually evolving to uh, uh, market and customer needs. Uh, and uh, just because the way requests um, between the platform and route services are secured currently uh, uses TLS doesn't mean that we can't add support for um, uh, additional mechanisms in the future. And, and just, uh, uh, I just wanted like uh, an API best practice. Um, one of the major important things about API best practices is never break the client. So if you are creating a new, if you're creating, if you're changing the security protocol, uh, our recommendation, and, and Apogee is also, will, will support various new security protocols as well, um, but our recommendation is to create a, a new version of that API notifying, uh, telling the user to use that part new, uh, new protocol. And then over time, as you migrate customers over to the, to the new version of the API, deprecate the old one. Great point. Yeah, makes a lot of sense, yeah. Um, and I, I heard something about Amazon Web Services, uh, AIM. Uh, actually, it, I think it's uh, IAM. Uh, Amazon, Apogee actually has uh, built-in support 
for uh, several IAM related services. So if you're trying to proxy, let's say you're trying to proxy AWS Lambda or you're trying to proxy SQS, uh, we have built-in connectors and sample code on how to do that properly. Perfect. Thank you, Alan. It looks okay, like, so we got uh, some... oh. Go ahead. It just looks like uh, uh, Sasan's clarification uh, is uh, sort of going in the same direction as um, somebody had asked about uh, LDAP integration. I agree. Yeah, how, yeah, I think that's... how is identity propagated so APIs can take action? So the, the most common technology uh, for identifying a user is OWASP. Uh, so whenever an app, uh, so whenever a, an application, uh, log, so let's say you have an app like a mobile app that logs in to a uh, login uh, site, it generates a OAuth token uh, for that particular user and device combination. So it's uh, the OAuth token is is for per user per device, and so whenever any API call subsequently gets uh, sent to Apogee, uh, Apogee can uh, break open the token and identify who that particular user is. And based on the user, uh, you can that user ID uh, can be forwarded down to the app so the app can take action based on the user. Uh, or the um, you can put in some uh, lightweight logic so that uh, inside uh, Apogee, uh, to uh, you know, maybe mediate or transform the request based on uh, what you want the API to do. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Alan. Okay, I think we have exhausted the question. Oh, no, no, no. Uh... Last one, okay. Um, Mastercard uh, Sassen asking again. Uh, so, what what is um, what is an API? Is a composition. Uh, hold on, let me just type other. Um, well, anyway, uh, what is an API? Is a composition and needs to propagate the identity to another API. Is it the same model? Okay, yeah, it's it's OAuth again, right? I mean, it's all the way you know, all the way down, isn't it? Yeah, what if? Uh, sorry, what if an API is a composition that needs to propagate uh, the identity to another API? Right. Okay, you got one calling another. I said, thank you, Sasson. Yep. Okay. Um, when I when I hear uh, what is what if an API is a composition, I I'm, I'm understanding this is what if an API is like a mashup of multiple uh, other APIs. Uh, exactly. So in, yeah. In this in this scenario, right, you can still do this, you can still do something very similar, whereby you can uh, break up the uh, you you can as the API comes into at the request comes into Apogee, uh, you can use um, you can use our security features to figure out which is the user ID of the user, and then potentially pass that down on to other uh, APIs. Uh, alternatively, you can just do pass through of the OAuth token to the other services, and the other services would have to break open the OAuth token and figure out the user ID itself. Awesome. Okay. Uh, and amazingly enough, uh, right on time, that, that brings us, I think, to the end of the question queue. Um, yeah, we'll we'll feel free to enter in one or two more just as we kind of wrap up here. But uh, you know, we were, we are recording this webinar, and we will post a replay of it uh, on on the Pivotal website um, on our YouTube channel. Um, and uh, actually, I was just about to hit that question. Yeah, thank you, Sasson. Um, you know, Alan, is this a demo something? Um, you know, besides obviously, it's going to be embedded in the webinar recording and replay, but is the demo available um, offline somewhere? Yeah, this demo is, um, there are going to be some links that we're going to be sending out to the attendees, uh, including documentation, and there's also a GitHub repo with uh, some of these, uh, with these example samples. And, you know, feel free Where to reach out to Apogee. 
Uh, there's yes. going to be some so, documentation and GitHub as well. So uh, feel free to reach out to Apogee and we can answer any questions. Uh, and last but not least, um, make sure if you have a chance, uh, please attend the uh, Cloud Foundry Summit, uh, where we'll be talking more about Cloud Foundry. That's going to be our, in uh, uh, May 21st. Uh, and you can learn more about Cloud Foundry at that time. Perfect. Uh, you beat me to it, Alan. Thank you. Um, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and that is going to be in Cloud Summit. It's going to be in Santa Clara, California, uh, May 23rd to 25th. Um, so definitely a great opportunity to learn more about Cloud Foundry and about, um, and about the Apogee integration there. Uh, okay. Um, one second. Just going to get my window back here. Bear with me. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, lost it. There it is. Okay. So uh, I'll, this is a good time to um, check the resources tab of your uh, ON24 presentation manager. Uh, you're in your user interface. There should be a, a tab down at the very bottom of the screen uh, <clears throat> for resources and some of the links uh, that Alan was just mentioning and you know for related to uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry follow up as well. Uh, some additional resources uh, and links are there. Um, Sawson, if you want, um, you know, just uh, we have your contact information. I'll make sure that that gets to Apogee if, if you guys need to exchange information about the offline demo. Um, but yeah, do check the resources tab right now, um, and uh, you know, pop those open in a browser tab or something because um, they will be gone when when we close the webinar. Uh, but we, you know, we will send those out in. Um, an email to you, uh, if, if the email you use to register for the event. So um, when the replay is published, we'll send you all the follow-up links um, as well as a, a link to the replay. Um, okay, all right. We, if there's a 404, Sawson, we'll, we'll make sure that that gets addressed before we send it out to you. So yeah, um, yeah. please uh, come visit us at, at Cloud Foundry Summit in Santa Clara. And uh, anything else you want to say, Alan or Shannon, to wrap it up before we call it a, call it a day? All right. Thanks, everyone, for your time, your attention, and all the interactivity. It's great. And uh, look forward to seeing you on a, on a future Pivotal webinar uh, and or at the Cloud Foundry Summit in Santa Clara. Thanks, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful day. Take care.